BBC One and iPlayer. Where do we go? Live Scottish Cup third round action. Air United versus Pollock live. Monday at 7.30 on the BBC Scotland channel and iPlayer. Good evening. Now on BBC Scotland, we join Gary and Laura with your news from Scotland and the world on The Nine. Tonight, the Supreme Court has its say, ruling the Scottish Government can't hold a referendum on independence without Westminster's consent. It sparks rallies in towns and cities across Scotland in support of independence, while the First Minister vows to find another way. We must and we will find another democratic, lawful and constitutional means by which the Scottish people can express their will. The UK government sticking to its line that now is not the time for another vote, while opinion across Scotland is divided. I think them saying just straight away, like, no, no, you can't do it, it's not fair for, like, you know, people of our, my age, you know. I don't think Scotland's ready for it. The last referendum debate was quite unpleasant. We'll speak to politicians and activists on both sides of the argument and look at what next for the independence movement. And I'm in Holyrood where we'll be reflecting on today's events and the implications for Scotland's future. Coming up in tonight's sport, what a day it's been at the World Cup. Some incredible results, including Japan's surprise win over Germany. And later, the former para-athlete who's to become the world's first disabled astronaut. Welcome to the Nine. It's a decision which will shape the Scottish political landscape for the next few years. Judges at the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court, have ruled that the Scottish Parliament cannot hold a second referendum on independence without the UK government's consent. The First Minister had wanted to hold a referendum on the 19th of October next year, but the court ruled unanimously that she didn't have the power to do so because the issue is reserved to Westminster. The UK government has refused to grant formal consent for a referendum. So what now? Well, Rishi Sunak welcomed the clear and definitive ruling from the Supreme Court, but he can't expect the debate to just disappear. Nicola Sturgeon shared her disappointment at the ruling, but said that in the absence of an agreement with Westminster, the SNP will fight the next general election on the single issue of independence, a de facto referendum. Tonight, we'll look at where this leaves Scotland's constitutional future. Laura Miller is at Holyrood for us. Laura. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Thanks, Gary. Good evening from Holyrood. It is all quiet here now, but uh, just a few hours ago, independent supporters gathered here to make their feelings known after that ruling today. It means, as we've said, that the parliament behind me does not have the power to hold another independence referendum without the consent of Westminster. It's a decision which has consequences and poses questions. We will debate all of that on the programme this evening. First, the BBC's Scotland editor, James. James Cook reports on today's events. Passions are running high on Scotland's streets tonight. Scotland! Campaigners for independence are out in force, demanding a vote on their future. After Downing Street refused to repeat the deal which set up the last referendum in 2014. That's why these five judges were considering the alternative, the Scottish Parliament holding a poll without the consent of Westminster. A lawfully held referendum would have important political consequences relating to the Union and the United Kingdom Parliament. Therefore... The Scottish Parliament does not have the power to legislate for a referendum on Scottish independence. This was not Nicola Sturgeon's preferred path to a referendum, and she admitted the judgment was a hard pill to swallow. This judgment raises profound and deeply uncomfortable questions about the basis and the future of the United Kingdom. Her response? Trying to frame the next general election as a referendum in all but name. Her opponents say that's illegitimate, and even some on her own side are concerned. 
What do you say to those supporters of independence who worry that you are leading them into a trap? We can't win 50% of the Scottish population's support for independence. We can't be independent. That applies in a referendum, and it would apply in a de facto referendum. That is an essential prerequisite of becoming independent. So anybody who says, oh, we can't do this because we might not win, well, if we can't win, we don't deserve to be independent. But the Prime Minister said, after a clear and definitive ruling, it was time to move on. I think that the people of Scotland want us to be working on fixing the major challenges that we collectively face, whether that's the economy, supporting the NHS, or indeed supporting Ukraine. What right does a man with no mandate have to deny Scottish democracy? But, but, Mr Speaker, when, when it comes to Scottish democracy, I'm pleased that this, the Scottish Government has one of the most powerful devolved assemblies anywhere in the world. So is this a bleak day for democracy or a triumph for common sense? I think it's a good thing. Um, the, as far as I understand it, that is not a devolved power. Um, my personal uh, preference is that we are part of the UK and be proud to be part of the UK. I think that people should have the right to vote about anything that they want without being stopped by any larger powers. And I think that kind of goes against any form of civil rights and like freedom of speech and freedom to vote. Uh, which women like myself have worked so very hard to do. I don't think Scotland's ready for it. The last referendum debate was quite unpleasant. The political debate is quite unpleasant. I think most people would, would pre prefer things to settle down before having that again. I mean, everyone has different opinions on it, but I think them saying just straight away, like, no, no, you can't do it. It's not fair for... Like, you know, people of our, my age, you know, who are just kind of starting to learn to vote and all that kind of stuff. And I just, it's not fair for us, you know. Today, our independence movement also becomes Scotland's democracy movement. So, Scotland remains divided. Defenders of the union may be quietly pleased tonight, but supporters of independence are making their voices heard. James Cook, BBC News, Edinburgh. Well, earlier I got reaction to the Supreme Court's decision from the Scottish Government's Constitution Secretary, Angus Robertson. We talked about that question of a so-called de facto referendum moving forward now, and I asked him what kind of election result his party would take as a mandate for independence. We've been told that notwithstanding the fact that we have the biggest ever majority in the Scottish Parliament in favour of a referendum, that that will not be recognised. We've now been told that a Section 30 uh, order will not be provided by the UK Government and we have the Supreme Court saying uh, that uh, the Scottish Parliament can't legislate on its own uh, to have a referendum on that. So what is left for Democrats to pursue a democratic answer to a democratic question? That has to be through the electoral process. Now, this is something quite new because on, a, on an important single constitutional question, there are all kinds of understandable questions that journalists and other people will want to know. And it, it will be something for the SNP and for the other pro-independence parties like the likes of the Scottish Greens to decide how are we going to approach this. And, and, and First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has announced that we're going to have a special conference in the SNP at the beginning of next year and this is exactly the kind of thing that we'll be discussing, debating and deciding on, on the next steps. Something that kind of came out from today from the First Minister, she did talk about, previously she was talking about the fact that it would be a general election that would be used as a de facto referendum. She did mention today, seemed to slightly change the goalposts or slightly become a bit more nuanced today and to suggest that if it wasn't a general election it could be a Scottish Parliament election. Would there, can you foresee that happening? Um, that does somewhat change the goalposts, doesn't it? Well, it could also involve a UK government realising that this can't go on like this. And the UK government could rethink their position. We have a new Prime Minister, after all, who says he's prepared to rethink. He even phoned Nicola Sturgeon, unlike his predecessor, who said that they wouldn't talk to the First Minister. There is still time, and there is, to have a grown-up conversation about uh, doing things through agreement as Democrats. Should that not come about, because of course that's our preferred outcome, um, then we have to use the options that are before us. And the next election is a, is a UK general election. Um, and so we will, you know, we will work towards that. And in the meantime, of course, what we are seeing, I think, literally between before our eyes, and that was people, the people who are demonstrating here tonight across Scotland, 
elsewhere in the UK and in the European continent, um, is that we're seeing things move from being about the question of independence to being about the question of democracy, moving from being an independence movement to being something much wider. Everything suggests in terms of the polls at the moment that we are split right down the middle as a country on this. Tomorrow we have the first national teachers' strike since the 1980s. We're talking about strikes in the NHS across the public sector. Um, is this really the priority of the government? Should government time be put into this at the moment when we have a cost of living crisis, when the next year, the next two years, we're told, are going to be so difficult? Should this be the priority? Well, the people made that decision. This was a decision that was made in an election that we had last year. And Before people the cost of elected, living crisis and, really took hold. Well, Before it, we have the current challenges across the public yeah, sector. I, look, I, I agree with you. Governments should be, doing, be able to do a number of things at the same time. Uh, and I agree that all of these things need, um, need maximum consideration uh, and we need to deal with the challenges uh, that face us. But the, the idea of having a referendum and becoming a sovereign state is so that we have the levers of power that all other normal countries have to resolve all of these challenges but we have a mandate the people have asked us to do something and we want to get on with what the people want us to get on the with. The charge would be though if you go on to fight a general election on a single issue the single issue of independence that you wouldn't be doing a service to that the problems the other problems that are affecting people's lives the cost of living crisis the well, NHS if, all the things that the Scottish government is, if these, is but, responsible but if for these, upholding. Okay but if these parties were so concerned about that they would recognise the mandate and allow the referendum to take place. You cannot argue both things simultaneously. Taking it to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has come back with that judgement that somehow the movement is being backed into a corner whereby you get to an election and if a 50% um, result is not given, then somehow the movement, the question of independence is then killed off. Yeah, I, ironically, it's the obverse because with all every passing year, um, Scottish society changes and as we know amongst younger voters the level of support between 16 and 35 year olds is running at between 60 and 70 percent. So the longer that opponents of independence put off the decision on whether should be Scotland become, uh, should become an independent country or not, they're actually doing their own cause a, a disservice. Not that I want to give them any tips on um, how you should uh, prosecute um, a democratic uh, argument. People have voted to have their say, they should have their say. I'd prefer that we did that through a referendum route. If that's closed off, then we have to use the electoral uh, system that we, that we have at our disposal. And then we will all stand before the electorate and saying, vote for, for, for our party for whichever reason. And if we win, as we have won the last eight elections, it should behove others in the UK government to recognise Scottish democracy and the fact that we want to give people a say. OK, Angus Robertson, Cabinet Secretary for the Constitution. We're already grateful for your time this evening on the 9th. Thank you. Yeah, the thoughts of Angus Robertson there. The thoughts now of our political correspondent, Lindsay Bewes, who joins me on this rather cold platform outside Holyrood. Um, Lindsay, we have the legal decision now, but how does that change the debate going forward, does it? Well, you heard Angus Robertson there talking about maybe the UK government, the Prime Minister, will have a rethink. That is extremely unlikely. Unless they have a complete change of heart in Westminster, then we're not going to see that referendum the Scottish government had planned on the 19th of October next year. They are now targeting the next general election as that so-called de facto referendum. So it is a much longer road now for their campaigners to go on. And as you said, we have legal clarity, but the politics is far from sorted out on this. It doesn't really take the pro-independence side any closer at all to that referendum. But today's judgment does give them that new campaigning line they are now going to be saying, and we've heard it already from the First Minister when she spoke at that rally uh, outside Holyrood here today, that this is not a voluntary union anymore. They're going to try and galvanise support around that line. Yeah, I mean, we've had the, the day to sort of digest and reflect upon what this might mean going forward. Um, one of the options that's been laid down by the SNP is that this now goes on to what they're calling a de facto referendum, that the next general election or the next Scottish Parliament election is essentially a single issue campaign on independence. Um, is that possible? Is a de facto referendum as they're laying it out possible? 
Well, that is what all those people attending rallies right across Scotland will be aiming for now. That's what independent supporters are looking at. But, you know, it's difficult. It's a big gamble. Uh, you know, you can't go into a general election expecting all of the parties to come together to campaign on a single issue. And there's questions about how, if they did manage to get over 50%, of the vote. Would that be recognised? How would opposition parties deal with that? The SNP and their supporters are going to say, though, well, look, you know, if we can't do it in an election and you're not going to give us a referendum, what are the options? OK, for the moment, Lindsay Buse, thank you very much for your thoughts. We'll be returning to you later in the programme. Well, it is eight years since Scotland first voted to remain in the UK. A lot has changed in that time. We've had Brexit, a pandemic, and now a cost of living crisis. Back in 2014, 45% voted for independence, 55 against. That nationwide result was mirrored in Fife. So, what do people there think of today's ruling? We went to Scotland's newest city, Dunfermline, to find out. <laughs> The country's been through a lot of change recently and I feel that they've, they deserve that right for the, the people of Scotland to make that decision about how we move forward. The law would have been drafted in such a way that there were reserved powers for Westminster and that was one of them, so I'm not surprised. It's, what we do next is interesting. But They should have the right to decide if, if, if we go for independence. don't have to vote for it if you don't want to. But I think it's the right decision. I think we had a referendum. And um, I think it's the whole of Britain that needs to take the whole thing into consideration. But I'm hopeful that it can be that the whole process can be used constructively so that the views of the Scottish public are seen. I've lived through many of these moments and I'm sure I'll live through a few more, but I have hope. Well, that's all from Holyrood for the moment, but we will be back later in the programme. But let's get more reaction to today's events with Laura and Gary in the studio. Laura, thank you very much for that. Well, as we just heard, the reality facing both the pro- and anti-independence movement is that the country is essentially split down the middle. And today's clarification of the law doesn't change the politics around the Constitution. With only a very narrow majority in favour of remaining in the UK, there will continue to be pressure on Westminster to grant another referendum. Well, let's speak now to the Conservative MSP, Miles Briggs. Good evening to you. Thank you for Good joining evening. us. Hi, Laura. What do you say to the First Minister, to her party and to their many hundreds of thousands, millions even, of supporters who say that this is no longer a voluntary union? Well, I don't agree with that, but I also think the First Minister is currently on the wrong side of public opinion. Um, there's less than a third of people in Scotland want another referendum next year. So we know already that Nicola Sturgeon is trying to push this on to the Scottish public. Uh, but we need to move forward. There's many challenges facing our country, and it's time that we came together and did just that. I welcome the Supreme Court ruling. It's clarified uh, what needed to be clarified. Uh, but we now need to move forward, and it's time for, I think, Nicola Sturgeon and the wider independence movement to accept that as well. Well, the opinion polls suggest that it's really neck and neck at the moment in terms of people having a view about the constitution. There's a pro-independence majority at Holyrood with the SNP and the Greens. They were voted in on a manifesto for to, to have an independence referendum. So why shouldn't they try and fulfil one of the things that they have been voted in to do. Well, and the First Minister said in the week before that election that it wasn't about another referendum. So she's changed her mind after votes are, are counted. Are we not a bit beyond um, this argument? Let's look at where we are right now, where we actually are today, where the reality is that it seems that almost, if not half of the country, want to vote on, on independence. What are you scared of? Well... What I want us to do is recognise the fact that we had a referendum. It was one of the most divisive events in our history. It was history. eight years ago, Mr and, Briggs, and, that, and a lot has changed since then. That referendum was put in place in 2011. There was a consensus from all political parties in Scotland to have that, to ask the people for, the, for their view on that, and we voted to remain part of the United Kingdom. Now, hours after that, uh, the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon's mentor, Alex Salmond, resigned, and we, we saw the SNP agitating for another referendum straight away. So the mandate is not there. And I think what we now need to see is well, the country focus on the things that really matter. And that's where the next general election will be about they, choosing they a, would argue a government. That they are, would argue the mandate is there. They now want to have a de facto next general election 
uh, election. And why how should how the are you First going Minister to fight that? Choose, how how well, are you going to defend the union? Why should the First Minister tell people what that election will be about? Well, she what says that, she has no choice. This well, is where that, she's been left at. That election, at. of course, could be about why does Scotland have the most highest record drug deaths in Europe? Why do we see a situation where we're seeing a growing attainment gap across Scotland? Why is our NHS in crisis? So how All will the you defend Nicola the union? Sturgeon. How will you and your party defend the union? Well, the then? next election will be about electing a UK government. I hope we'll see another UK Conservative government elected. Uh, but it's not for Nicola Sturgeon or Angus Robertson to dictate to the Scottish people what that election will be about. Well, in that case, should Rishi Sunak not sit down and have a discussion with the First Minister about this and agree to grant this Section 30 so that there can be a legally binding referendum? Well, no, we need both governments to work together on the issues that matter now. And I think cost of living crisis, working actually together to get families through this period is what needs to happen. And that's where I think a different relationship has already started to emerge. And I welcome that. I think the Prime Minister is trying to build that relationship. And that's what we need to see. And that's what people expect from their two governments. Are you listening at all to the voices of the people who don't feel the same way that you do? Yes, and I respect the fact that people will not, you know, I disagree as well with people who want an independence referendum, but I also uh, think we need to respect democracy, and that's where the referendum in 2014 has not been respected by Nicola Sturgeon. She doesn't respect any referendum, in fact, and I think what we now need to do as a country is move beyond that. I also think the strategy she's... Uh, brought forward around this has not worked. I think there will be many people in the independence movement actually questioning where she's taken them tonight as well. Well, she and her party would argue that you're not respecting democracy in terms of respecting the recent election results that they have had at general election, Holyrood election and local election level. Well, like I've said, the First Minister said the Holyrood election wasn't about another referendum in the last week of that campaign. And um, what we need to actually do is move forward from this. And Nicola Sturgeon needs to stop trying to drag the country back to the divisions of the past. We need to move forward as a country. And I think that's where the majority of people uh, want their politicians to start taking the country. Will you be working with the other pro-union parties in doing this then? Will you be talking to Labour and the Liberal Democrats now about the way forward and, and as you do approach this general election? Well, that's something we'll have to consider as the strongest unionist party in Scotland. If this is what Nicola Sturgeon's going to fight the ground on, then we as a Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party will be that voice for unionists across Scotland who want to send her that message that they reject this idea. Uh, but more importantly, we want to get on with the things that really matter. You know, I was in the Parliament today debating the homeless crisis. Here in the capital, we have a record number of children living in temporary accommodation under this SNP government. That is a shame. And that is something the Scottish ministers are fully responsible for. Okay. So we need to get back to the issues that matter to people, not more constitutional division. Miles Briggs, thank you for Thanks joining us much. tonight on The Nine. Well, Downing Street has said the UK government does not agree with Nicola Sturgeon's proposal to use the next election as a de facto referendum. Let's get more on that and reaction from The Nine's Westminster correspondent, Rajdeep Sandhu. And Rishi Sunak was challenged, Rajdeep, on the UK government's position at Prime Minister's Questions today. Yes, he was, Gary, and I've been speaking to many Conservatives across the Conservative Party machine about their reaction to uh, that decision today. And a lot of them have been very keen to point out to me that they are not feeling triumphalist, as Ian Blackford was describing Conservatives in PMQs to Rishi Sunak today, that they understand the seriousness of this. But they do feel like they're, now that there is this clarity, it is time to move on. Essentially, what we were hearing there from Miles Briggs, one person told me that the UK government, frankly, has bigger fish to fry, that the government's priorities should be around the cost of living, the energy crisis and kick-starting the economic growth we keep hearing about. And that was also the message, essentially, from the Prime Minister. Rishi Sunak welcomed the decision, but he was also talking about how it was time to focus on those priorities, the things that they think people are more concerned about and to work together the UK and Scottish governments and that seems to be a charge that Rishi Sunak wants to lead talking about how he called uh, Nicola Sturgeon very soon after he became Prime Minister. But what's also quite interesting, what I've been picking up from my chats today, is one of the big questions the SNP MPs kept raising and Rishi Sunak didn't quite answer was what was the democratic path to a referendum and from my chats today it seems the answer is to have a similar situation to 2014 where there is cross-party consensus and civic consensus for an independence referendum and I think lots of Conservatives 
feel quite relaxed at the moment because in their opinion, they don't think that threshold has been met yet. And Rajdi, what is Labour's position on a de facto referendum at the next election? Well, they're just not really going to play ball with that argument with the SNP's, what they would probably describe as a bit of uh, politicking and game playing. They say their manifesto will be based on, uh, you know, the issues that are facing people at the time of that election, not just on independence. And while they admit that the status quo clearly isn't working, they say the way to get out of that is to elect a Labour government. And of course, we've heard from both Keir Starmer and Anas Sawa, the Scottish Labour leader and the UK Labour Party leader, uh, that there will be no deals with the SNP if that situation ever arose, when they need, if they needed the SNP to get into power. We've heard a reiteration of that again today from Keir Starmer's spokesperson, but they just don't want to play that game of calling it a de facto uh, referendum. They will be playing it as a general election and talking about many, many issues. Rajdeep Sandhu at Westminster, thank you very much. So in the wake of the Supreme Court ruling, the First Minister said the SNP will use the next general election as an attempt to show a majority of people in Scotland support independence. So what are the practical realities of turning that vote into a de facto referendum? Well, I asked Professor of Politics at Strathclyde University, Sir John Curtis. The first thing, of course, is that people need to be willing to vote on the basis of the constitutional question, whether or not they want Scotland to be independent. Now, it has to be said that on that criterion, the outlook for Nicola Sturgeon is quite good. Because the truth is, if we look at what happened at the Holyrood election last year, that was pretty much what most people were doing, at least so far as whether or not they were voting more for or against a nationalist party. I, you can, I've looked today at three high quality sources of polling done after the last Holyrood election. And what you discover is that 89% of those people who say they are currently supporters of independence voted for the SNP or the Greens and only 10% of those who voted no. The truth is that the constitutional question already shapes how people in Scotland vote to a greater extent than Brexit did in 2019 in the UK election held then, which of course was meant to be the central issue of that election. What of course we don't know is whether or not there is sufficient support for independence and therefore perhaps for the SNP for her to be able to get above the 50% mark if indeed that's the issue upon which voters decide to vote again. Because the truth is at the moment, support for independence on average in the polls is a little bit below that for support for the union. And I think for so long as uh, the polls are not showing independence clearly ahead, then getting past the 50% mark is going to be quite a challenge. But then the truth is it would equally have been a challenge if we'd had a referendum in October of next year. And when it comes to the idea of fighting a UK election as a referendum on a single issue, not talking about the other issues, which may well concern the electorate, uh, Nicola Sturgeon's political opponents are not going to want to go along with that. No, no, the political opponents, of course, will want to say, no, elections are about lots of other things. But of course, some of those opponents, particularly inside the Conservative Party, were insisting that in December 2019, that was an election about Brexit and because they won a majority, it was clear that that's what voters wanted. So you know, I can argue here about the consistency of some of the arguments being deployed. But sure, in the end, it is up to voters. But the truth is, and one of the reasons why life for the opposition parties in Scotland have been so difficult in the last few years is that voters, for the most part, have not been voting on the question of, has the attainment gap in education been reduced? Have waiting lists in the NHS been reduced? Voters will say we're not entirely sure that any of these things have been achieved but for the most part voters are continuing to, to vote for the SNP because they support independence and that for them has in recently recent years at least been the predominant issue and in Scotland the, the battle lines at recent elections have been between the SNP and the Conservatives mm -hmm. they've been the, the the predominant parties the Labour Party doing better in the opinion polls mm -hmm. at the moment how might that impact on what we're talking about here as regards the de facto well it's certainly true that of the unionist parties, the one party that is best able to win over at least a group of uh, supporters of independence is the Labour Party. So in that, to that extent, at least the rise in Labour's popularity, which just mirrors what's been going on south of the border, does perhaps make life more difficult for the SNP, uh, that perhaps some risk of leakage to the Labour Party. The second thing, of course, is 
We have been promised by the Labour Party, we've been promised, however, for quite some time, that they are going to come up with yet another plan for more devolution. Of course, what the SNP will respond is, well, it's fine to come up with more devolution, but A, they will say, well, look at what the Supreme Court has just said. There are, the, unless we are allowed in future to be able to run referendums on independence, we're not sure this devolution is going to be worth it. And the second issue, of course, is Brexit. There is no scheme of more devolution that seems likely to be able to satisfy the SNP's discontent and the discontent of the majority of people in Scotland uh, with the fact that Scotland is outside the European Union. So unless Labour can address those two issues, it may, they may well find that, yes, a bit more, more devolution, and we've had two major chunks already, won't necessarily change uh, people's uh, perspective that, to that extent. We're grateful once again for your analysis. Professor Sir John Curtis, thank you. You're welcome. Now, in other news, for the first time in nearly 40 years, almost every state school in Scotland will be closed tomorrow because of strike action by teachers. And today, another union confirmed plans for school strikes next month. But the Scottish Government says that the union's pay claims are unaffordable. Our news correspondent, Jamie McIver, reports. Tomorrow is an unexpected day away from school, but for some students it will be no day off. Some are working hard for good exam grades. So prelims are coming up, so I just plan on revising for my prelims, and yeah, that's practically it. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to work on my personal statement that I need to send off to uni and study for a test I have coming up. I'll be studying for my prelims as well, and I'll be prepping for my interviews as well for uni. And for some parents, it'll be anything but a holiday. If you're a single parent and you don't have a family network to support you, then how are you going to manage work and juggling if you've got two or three kids at the same time? Um, we also need to remember the parents of pupils with additional support needs. Those pupils really thrive on routine, and when that routine is, is disturbed or broken, then it can cause them a lot of distress, which then in turn obviously causes a lot of stress for the parents too. The strike may only be the first. Two other teachers' unions are planning action in a fortnight. Then the EIS will walk out again in January. All three unions still hope a long dispute can be avoided. We'd certainly be hopeful that, whether it's ourselves or, or other teacher unions, that well, we, don't need to, we would hope we don't need to take action at all, but if we do, that, that is short term and that you know, sees a change in approach from government. But we will be guided, as always, by our members. Um, and if they are in it for the long haul, we are in it for the long haul on their behalf. Teachers are being offered a rise of between 5 and 6.8 per cent, well below the 10 per cent unions want. A 10 per cent increase is just unaffordable for the Scottish Government. We have a fixed budget, it is already fully utilised for this year, so to do anything that would increase the, the resolution that we have on this would mean that money would have to come from elsewhere. So I'm very disappointed that we're moving to strike action. It's disruption for our children and young people and their families that we simply don't want to see. Tonight, teachers across Scotland are preparing for their first national strike since the mid-1980s. They'd hoped the mere threat would be enough. Will it be possible to stop the dispute escalating further? Jamie McIver, BBC News. To Ukraine now, and Russia has launched another wave of missile strikes, damaging critical power infrastructure. In Zaporizhia, a newborn baby was killed when a rocket hit a maternity unit near the city in the region with Europe's largest nuclear power plant. There were several explosions in the capital, Kyiv, and an air raid alert was issued for the whole country. While all of the western city of Lviv is reported to be without power after it came under heavy bombardment. Ukraine's President Zelensky and you said Ukrainians would get through these attacks and restore power. The BBC's Europe correspondent Jessica Parker reports from Kyiv. Smoke billows out on the horizon from Kyiv. A city, a country, again waiting to see what damage has been done. Just outside the capital, these flats, these homes, were caught up in today's strikes. People forced to leave buildings now completely exposed to the cold, carrying what they can from places that are no longer safe. We heard rockets flying, and then we heard a loud explosion. A colleague saw a red light. In our educational centre, windows and doors blew out, the ceiling fell. The darkness sets in with few lights to show the way. 
for people trying to find out what's happened and where to go next. We are evacuating people from the building that was damaged. Those who need to sleep somewhere, we are taking them to a hotel where they can stay as long as they need. There will be food and heating there. That bus is just leaving, taking residents who can no longer stay in their homes, perhaps because of the damage, but also there's no power here. The only reason we can see anything at the moment is because of the lights coming from the emergency vehicles, fire trucks and police cars. People here, there's a lot of activity, but they just pass you like shadows. Tonight, this city and the area around it left in the dark after strikes that have hit across Ukraine. Authorities had been working to repair energy infrastructure damaged in previous attacks. Today, a serious setback in trying to keep the country warm this winter. I've just lost my home, she says. He tries to comfort her. Tonight, Kyiv and many places plunged into darkness. Jessica Parker, BBC News. You're watching The Nine, still to come tonight. We'll hear from one of the pro-independence campaigners who took to the streets tonight and also from a business group that supports the union. And Paralympic sprinter John McFalls chosen as the first disabled astronaut by the European Space Agency. Goals galore at the World Cup. Lewis is here with more. Hello. Yeah, what a day it was. There was upsets in the cards and plenty of goals, like you say, Laura, but still not quite feeling like a World Cup for me. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, but it needs to be summer. Exactly, exactly. But we'll make do. We'll talk about the goals. Yes, good evening. Well, it's been an incredible day at the World Cup, not least for this team here, Japan, who shocked Germany with a historic win. It started so well for Germany too when Ilkay Gundogan gave them a first half lead from the penalty spot before Japan substitute. Ritzel Doan equalised in the 75th. And before we came on air, I spoke to football journalist Fumi Nakabachi and her husband Yushin, who is also a journalist. They're both from Japan and now live here in Scotland. Most of the Japanese media mention it's a giant killing. And my sister sent an email from Tokyo soon after the match, even midnight in Japan. And she was so surprised. Also, a big city like Tokyo or Osaka, young football supporters were gathering city center, and police call them calm down, but they are not. They're still exciting, yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. And Yushin, we've seen some of those celebrations. Just how much does this mean to the people back in Japan just now? Yeah, I think it is um, much more than people expected to. So therefore, I think they may be surprised. <laughs> and so just uh, nobody, I think, expected this kind of victory. Yeah, of course. And, and for me, it's a difficult group, mind you. Spain are in there, and we've seen how good how good they are at the moment. How how optimistic yes. are are you for Japan in this World Cup? Oh, <laughs> Asano made a goal. Uh, he said. German is uh, strong, but he doesn't care because the Japanese team worked for four and a half years and they want to make a thing. Uh, Japan won against Spain in Glasgow 2012, uh, part of London Olympic, yeah. and that was called Glasgow Miracle. Well, from a Glasgow miracle, uh, you've seen to hopefully more miracles in Qatar. Do you think Japan can follow <laughs> this result up with more miracles in Qatar? Last week, there was a newspaper article in Japan who would succeed Moriyasu as a national coach. So nobody expected Moriyasu team would win this uh, World Cup. So I think that, so I think this today's result may give the team confidence confidence indeed and with the 2014 winners shocked in Germany there and their opener how would 2010 champion Spain manage in their first game well this man here Martin Boyle was due to be playing for Australia at the World Cup but has withdrawn because of injury at the weekend now Hibs have confirmed that the winger is going to be out for the season after undergoing surgery on his knee and Celtic have signed Japanese centre-back Yuki Kobayashi on a five-year deal. The 22-year-old will join from J-League club Vissel Kobe next month and will be eligible to play in competitive games when the window opens in January. 
And finally, a Fife schoolgirl says it's surreal that she's become a Scottish boxing history maker, having only taken up the sport a few years ago. 16-year-old Neve Mitchell topped the podium at last month's EUBC European Junior Championships, breaking new ground for the sport in the country in the process. And Tyrone Smith reports. Packing a punch. At just 16 years old, Neve Mitchell's already taken her place in the history books. The Dunfermline High School pupil prevailed in the light bantamweight category at the European Junior Championships in Italy, becoming the first Scottish female boxer to win gold at any major international competition. It's just surreal. Even a year ago, I didn't think I could achieve any of this. I think boxing was just a hobby. I just did it because I liked it. I kept boxing, I started off. When I was younger, I used to get bullied when I was about five. So I start, my dad sent me to kept boxing and that was the only sport I, I like, stuck at. Mitchell, who only took the sport up three and a half years ago, is just the seventh Scot of any gender to become an amateur European champion. Her success comes at a time when women's professional boxing is booming, thanks to superstars like Clarissa Shields and Savannah Marshall, who went head-to-head -head in London last month. I think it gives me something to look up to, to be fair. I think it gives me something to look forward to, because I see all the girls in this sport, like boxing, and I think maybe that could be me one day. We've got a stack of young girls that are in here now in the, in the minis and the, the kids section. They're looking up to Neve, but she's, she's just done it after three and a half years. It's there for anybody, you know. However, Neve is going to park her dreams of boxing glory for the next few months as she turns her attention back to her school books and hopefully delivering a knockout set of results in her higher exams. Tyrone Smith, BBC News. Well, it's brilliant to see you, isn't it, guys? That's your sport for the Yeah, season. good for her. Yeah. And can we go back to Japan for that analysis after every game? Ah, that was no, great. How good was that? I'm, I'm jealous, you know, as a Scotland fan. I love seeing teams get these big results, and I wish we were there, but how good was that for Japan? Yeah. What a day. As a Scotland fan, you're going to be disappointed a lot, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, Never you, mind. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, Cheers. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you. Now, Paralympic sprinter John McFall has been named the best, the first disabled astronaut by the European Space Agency. He was unveiled alongside other new recruits at a news conference in Paris this afternoon. He'll train to be a para-astronaut, but it might be a few years yet until he gets to go to space. The BBC's science editor, Rebecca Morell, reports. It's the job of dreams, with an office that's got spectacular views, offering an out-of-this-world experience. Many would love to be an astronaut, but very few make the cut. Now in Paris, the European Space Agency has added some new names to the role of honour. Selected from more than 22,000 applicants, this is the astronaut class of 2022. But for the first time, ESA is widening its pool of talent by recruiting the first ever para-astronaut. I think being an amputee, I... The, being an astronaut was never really on my radar. John McFall is a Paralympian sprinter. His right leg was amputated above the knee after a motorbike accident. He's been selected using exactly the same criteria as all European astronauts. The only difference is he has a disability. I thought I would have the skills, a mix of skills and scientific background that I could really help them uh, answer this, this very uh, aspirational question of can we get someone with a physical disability uh, into space, to work in space safely. All astronauts have to undergo rigorous training. Part of John's job will be to test how the kits like spacesuits and spacecraft need to be adapted. His selection doesn't mean he'll definitely get to go into space, but ESA wants to pave the way to make it happen. The people who've uh, lived with a disability have overcome challenges through their life. The challenge of going into space, they bring something, well, something extra compared to the rest of the crew, and that's what we really want to bring through this project. The last time a British astronaut got one of the jobs was more than a decade ago. That was Tim Peake, who got his trip to the International Space Station in 2016. Now two more Brits may get the chance of a mission. Megan Christian, who's in the reserve squad, and Rosemary Coogan, an astrophysicist, who's part of the Professional Astronaut Corps and will start her new job soon. How are you feeling about the training that's ahead? I mean, today's just the beginning, really, isn't it? 
Yeah, absolutely. Today is just the beginning. It's the, the end of a very long selection process, and but in no way an end. It's the beginning of a whole new chapter. I think the training is going to be incredibly exciting. I can't wait to spend more time with my colleagues and we'll all be in it together. There will soon be many opportunities for these new astronauts, including trips to the moon with the Artemis mission. The hope is this marks the moment we open up space to everyone. Rebecca Morrell, BBC News, Paris. Let's go back to our main story tonight and the Supreme Court ruling that Holyrood doesn't have the authority to hold another independence referendum without the UK government's consent. So what were the reactions of activists and long-time campaigners to today's news? For both sides, it's been a clear-cut result, but with very different perspectives. Let's chat to Andrew Wilson, who's from Time for Scotland, which organised that Holyrood rally tonight. And Struan Stevenson, CEO of the pro-union business group Scottish Business UK, and of course a former Conservative MEP. Good evening to you both. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. Good evening. Andrew, what was your reaction when you heard the news from the Supreme Court? Uh, well, I think there was, across the, across the independence movement, there's a degree of disappointment. Uh, the outcome and the decision is not a particular surprise. Uh, I think that what we've heard very clearly from the Supreme Court this morning is that the, uh, what we were previously told was the world's most powerfully devolved government is, is nothing of the kind. Uh, with the, what we were told was a union of equals is, is nothing of the sort. Uh, and I think that the, 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 the illusion of democracy uh, in Scotland uh, has been completely dispelled by the court's decision this morning. Uh, and I think that people across Scotland, uh, as they realise that the court has confirmed that there is, a, there is an absence of democracy, that there's a significant democratic deficit in Scotland, uh, I don't think Scots are going to stand for that. And Struan, what are your thoughts then on those who want to stay in the union? Are they really going about it the right way by continuing to deny another legally binding referendum? Well, you know, I agree with Andrew when he said it was a foregone conclusion. I mean, people anticipated that that would be the outcome of the Supreme Court ruling. So why, we have to ask, did the SNP government spend hundreds of thousands of pounds of taxpayers' money taking this massive 8,000-page submission to the Supreme Court when we knew what the outcome would be. And now we equally knew that Nicola Sturgeon and her uh, cohorts would start saying, oh, it's all unfair and, you know, the Supreme Court is biased and it's London-based and it's all the wicked Tory government's fault. We're fed up with all this. It's time to move on. It's time that the people's welfare became the focus of the SNP government and but not this tedious debate about independence. Today's ruling does leave an uncomfortable question for unionists like yourself, Struan Stevenson, which is what is the democratic route to a referendum and for Scotland to express its will uh, and its, uh, its view of the union? Well, the democratic route was tested in 2014. Then we had the trauma of the Brexit referendum. Then we had two years of lockdown. Now we've got a crisis in the economy, a crisis at cost well, of living. I understand those are that situation at the moment. But how, how do those who want another referendum get that democratically? Well, you know, I've heard people arguing all day since the Supreme Court ruling that SNP supporters say if they lost Indiref 2, if it's eventually held, they would then demand Indiref 3, never endems. However, if unionists lose the next referendum, the SNP would say, that's it, finished, we're an independent Scotland forever, and at the huge cost to all of us that that would uh, be, it would be a catastrophe. Andrew, I wonder, a lot of independent supporters themselves have some doubts about the idea of this going to a, a de facto referendum. Is it fair for the SNP, the Greens, ALBA, for, for independent supporting parties to, to dictate the terms of a general election when there are so many important issues that people vote on for, for a wide variety of reasons? Well, it's an interesting point that you make. The, it's very clear that in the way in which uh, uh, elections in this country operate is that the various political parties put forward a manifesto uh, and then people are asked to vote on that manifesto. 
And if in these circumstances the SNP and perhaps the Green Manifesto is focused on one item, then that is the manifesto that has been put forward. It's not the case that the political parties are dictating anything. It is that they are well, putting Well, they it, are essentially rewriting the terms, aren't they, of, of a general election? You're, you're voting for your local MP. Uh, well, and as I said, on a variety of issues, especially right now, we're, we're in a cost of living crisis. People want to know about economic policy, about health policy, about all manner of different things. Well, we saw that the 2019 general election became an election about Brexit. So there's plenty of precedent for elections becoming single issue ones. And of course, the point about uh, putting the question of independence forward now, why it's so critical now, is that we are in a cost of living crisis that has been created by the current Westminster Tory government. In a country which, is such, which has such abundant energy, we pay the, we pay the highest price for energy anywhere in Western Europe. And that is as a result of energy policy being reserved to London. So the route to fix and to address the crises that we're facing at the moment is, is clearly only through independence. And that was underlined again last week with the, uh, with the Chancellor's autumn statement. In that autumn statement, there was nothing put forward about parents, nothing put forward about children. And in contrast, of course, in Scotland, as a result of the political process, the Scottish child payment and other approaches to seek to improve and to protect the poorest and, the, and children in our society, okay. those are our choices. And so the way to, the way to continue that process it is clearly because democracy at Westminster does not exist for Scottish voters. The only way to address that is through independence. Very brief point to you, Struan Stevenson. Uh, how do, do the unionists, the pro-union parties, address that de facto referendum if that's what happens? Well, it's incredible arrogance of the First Minister to suggest that they can dictate the terms of a general election in the United Kingdom. But, you know, from my perspective, bring it on because I think it will end very badly for the SNP when people are really worried about a whole range of poverty crisis, NHS crisis, education crisis, and they see a one tedious independence issue in the SNP Green Manifesto, then I think the SNP will lose a lot of support. Okay. That, that may be the end of independence. Struan Stevenson, Andrew Wilson, thank you both so much for joining us tonight on The Nine. Thank you. Now, let's turn our attention to the weather forecast. Christopher is here. What are we expecting? Um, some fairly strong winds tomorrow and some heavy rain, but some sunshine for some later in the day. Sunshine and showers. The usual. Yes. Well, the shower is quite heavy, actually. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> let's take a look at all the details. Thanks very much indeed. Good evening to you. We ended today with a number of showers and some sunshine, but those showers still with us, actually, overnight tonight. A mixture of clouds, some clear skies, and a rash of showers, particularly through parts of the west and the northwest. Temperatures in town, 4 to 7 Celsius, so not as cold as last night. Now, first thing tomorrow, we do have a Met Office yellow warning for... High winds through parts of Kintyre, Arran, Ayrshire and Dumfries and Galloway. That starts at 8am. You'll notice, though, first thing for many, it's dry. Just one or two showers. The wind's already beginning to pick up. Temperatures at 8 in the morning, 5 to 7 Celsius. So it's a quiet start to the day, but it doesn't stay that way because as we head through the course of Thursday morning, as I say, those winds will be strengthening in the southwest and accompanied by some strong, uh, some heavy rain, I should say. So you can see, actually, there it is, that narrow band of rain pushing its way eastward through the course of the day, initially in the west and then tracking east through the afternoon. If you're underneath it, it will be wet, but it should be moving through at a pace. There's the sunshine through the afternoon in the west, in the east, staying cloudy and wet, and the wind still brisk from the south. Temperatures 8 to 11 Celsius. So that's Thursday. Friday, we've got high pressure to the south of us, trying to influence conditions, and it means it will be a quieter day. Some sunshine, still windy, still a few showers, these chiefly across parts of west central Scotland and the northwest, but elsewhere, through much of central eastern and southern Scotland, it's dry with some sunshine, temperatures 8 to 11 Celsius, but once again, pretty breezy from the south. To the weekend, low pressure never far away. Here we have it, sat up towards Iceland. That means weather fronts, that means showers, rain and some strong winds. On Saturday, cloudy with rain at times, but mild, 11 to 13 Celsius. Still windy around the west coast. On balance, I think Sunday probably the better of the two days this weekend. A little bit more in the way of sunshine. Still a rash of showers in the west and northwest. Temperatures once again around 9 to 11 Celsius by mid-afternoon. That's the forecast. Sunshine and downpours then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank Thanks, Chris. Much.
And that's almost all from us on the day the Supreme Court ruled that the Scottish Government cannot hold a referendum on independence without Westminster's consent. Before we go, though, let's return to Laura Miller at Hollywood. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Thanks, Gary. Welcome back to Holyrood, where it has been an eventful day. It all began just before 10 o'clock this morning in a hushed Supreme Court in London. 12 hours later, the story very much come back to this place now and towards what happens next and Scotland's constitutional future. Well, our political correspondent, Lindsay Bewes, is still with me now. Um, Lindsay, as we've seen today from events, as we've heard from discussions over this hour, um, this is a live issue and a vote an emotive issue for many, but for some it will have drawn a line, it should have drawn a line under matters. Yeah, we've seen that reflected in tonight's programme, haven't we? While some people are very disappointed by what the court has found in its judgment and are now looking towards that next general election and a kind of a two-year campaign for independence. Others are saying, well, they're relieved and they would actually rather the focus was on other issues such as the cost of living, uh, the crisis in the NHS. Of course, Nicola Sturgeon would argue that uh, solving those issues, uh, independence is needed for that. Uh, so you really have a split, don't you? And the polls haven't moved either. We're looking at around 50% of people supporting independence, around 50% of people saying, no, they don't want independence. So we really are in the same kind of position that we were in before. We're in a kind of new holding pattern now, if you like, that has moved on to building up to that general election. Yeah, and as we look ahead, I'm interested to know where you think or how you think this plays out, especially in, in the near future. Yeah, well, we've seen kind of galvanisation of the base today. They have turned up for these rallies. How much can they build that momentum and keep that going? As for the SNP, well, we already know Nicola Sturgeon intends to hold that special conference in the new year where the strategy for going into that general election as a de facto referendum will be discussed. Laura, it's going to be really interesting as well to see how the SNP bring the other parties and the wider independence movement into to that and how they all get on the same page approaching that general election. Yeah, and listen, we know we have a tough few years ahead. We know we're told that in terms of the economy, in terms of the cost of living, things can change and things can change quickly. How do you see that or how do you see plans as we have them perhaps today changing as we move forward? Yeah, just look at the last few years. The COVID pandemic, no one could have predicted that. And before that, the Brexit referendum changed the narrative on this story once again. So two years is a long time. As you say, a lot can happen in that time. But what we see in Scotland is always the constitutional politics is the backdrop. It has been since the build-up to the 2014 referendum. I think it will continue to be until this issue is resolved one way or the other. Will that be after that general election, that de facto general election? Well, we will have to see, Laura, how all that plays out and it could be pretty messy. Yeah, indeed. We certainly have an interesting few weeks and months ahead, don't we? Thank you, Lindsay Bewes. Well, that is all we have time for on this special programme from Holyrood. The legal question then has been answered. The political one, not so much. As everyone digests and reflects on today's events, one thing is clear. The new year will bring more debate, more discussion, and we will be right here to cover it all. But right now, for the moment, from here at Holyrood, good night. <laughs>